How are we doing? Wednesday, 3 o'clock, Dr. Gary Huber. I am here with Dr. Timothy Kitzmiller. This is going to be epic. You snore, or your wife snores, or your husband snores, I'll bet you, because it is so common. We're going to talk about sleep. This has been Sleep Week. We've been posting sleep articles. We're going to talk about the impact that snoring has on your health. It's bigger than you think. It's bigger than most people were willing to admit. We're going to talk about solutions, and it's not just about CPAP. So stay tuned. If you know anybody that snores, you better share this with them. It's going to be important. It could save their life. See you in a minute. I just marinated it in plastic. We don't like plastic, we like glass. Why do we care about all this plastic? What's the big it's deal? It's a toxic bomb. Our whole practice is based on getting you to be the best version of yourself. Remove the crappy foods, the wheat, the dairy, the sugar. Everything we do is based in the medical literature and, and evidence-based medicine. We're gonna look at how to get you healthy, not how to get you on medicines, how to get you off medicine. There's a couple of very curious things that CBD oil does. Helping people with migraine headaches reduce the frequency and intensity of their headache. People that have ADD or ADHD, anxiety or mood swings or depression. These things can help decrease anxiety and make a child more calm. Lyme has been found from coast to coast. 50% of all counties in the United States have Lyme disease documented. Well, hello, Dr. Gary Huber, Dr. Timothy Kissman. I've been waiting to get you in here to talk. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna spend a good amount of time today. First of all, I want your questions because I know you have them. Every time that I'm with patients, and you know, we're, we're about getting patients to live longer and be healthier, and that always comes up, you know, how are you sleeping? How is your energy? How is your brain? These are questions we ask every single patient. And historically and classically, repetitively, people go, well, my sleep's interrupted, or it's this, or it's that, and I ask them if they snore. And quite commonly, it's, yeah, I snore a little, or I snore some. And what we want to do today, and this is going to be important if you're watching this or, or if you're watching it even after it's been recorded, if you snore, I want you to recognize some basic truths. I'm going to let Dr. Kitzmiller drive the conversation today. But if you snore, there's a good chance you have sleep apnea. If your spouse snores or if you heard them gasping in the middle of the night, even just occasionally, there's a good chance they have sleep apnea. What is sleep apnea? To most people, it just means, oh, I have to wear one of those fighter pilot masks. Sleep apnea uh, is, is your oxygen dropping so low that it's affecting your nervous system, which leads to heart disease and brain disease and a risk for Alzheimer's. If you have headaches, and we're gonna go through some of the symptoms. This is a huge topic that gets swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. Very few people really ever get diagnosed. And as you shared with me, one of the statistics that, that shocked me, mm -hmm. you said of all the people with sleep apnea, what percentage of them actually get diagnosed and treated? 10%. 10%. 10%. So nine out of 10 people are gonna suffer the consequences because they don't even know. Correct. They don't Correct. even know. They assume snoring, snoring is normal. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm tired because I'm getting older. I mean, everybody gains weight as you get older, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So tell me, get, get people kind of oriented. How did you get into this? You were sharing with me a little bit ago, about 10 years ago, you, your first patient was? Uh, a guy named Tim Kitzman. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for uh, 23 years of our married life, uh -huh. uh, I had always snored apparently. It didn't bother me. I had no problem with it, but uh, my side would hurt in the morning from an elbow <laughs> shot. So I figured after 23 years, my wife deserved a uh, good night's sleep. Isn't that amazing? We, guys will do this. Oh, I snore, but it doesn't bother me. It's yeah. Normal. Everybody Have you snores. talked to your spouse? Maybe right. it's bothering her just a little. Yeah. Well, yeah. as a side, I never realized this until we went down this rabbit hole. Yeah. I had the snoring problem, the sleep apnea problem. Yeah. But my snoring was fragmenting her sleep, so she had a secondary sleep issue because of my snoring keeping yeah. her from dropping into deep stage sleep. Yeah. And I tell my patients all the time, you want to live long, mm -hmm. you want to avoid the Alzheimer's unit. Yeah. The quality of your sleep throughout the duration of your life, the quality of your sleep determines how fast you age. Exactly. Women don't want wrinkles and guys don't want to get Alzheimer's, and yet we don't pay respect to the very element that reduces that risk dramatically. Exactly. Just that, that deep sleep and that REM stage sleep uh -huh. is the most important. That's yep. the reparative time of sleep where your body, the immune system, it recharges, it rebuilds. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, those are the points in time where the body is so relaxed, you're getting into that deep state that the airway collapses, the tongue drops back, and mm -hmm. you get that apneic episode. So that's a big thing for us when we're talking to people. We ask them, do you even dream? Because yeah. if you can't get into that stage, you're not getting into REM. Right. Your body's not repairing itself. Right. And those are the things that 
lead to the aging process. So tell me this, there are going to be people watching this that are going to say, yeah, well, maybe I snore once in a while, but it's not consistent or it's only when I've had too much to drink. Right. But what are the symptoms that somebody might be having that lead you to believe that they have a risk for sleep apnea, even if they do or don't snore? Um, a big one that we see are morning headaches. Mm -hmm. People that come in with morning headaches, mm -hmm. uh, chronic fatigue is a huge one. Um, reflux can be a big one. Another one that cardiologists are sending people to us for is, you know, I've, I've been getting this fluttering in my heart periodically. Yeah. Um, so things like that. Uh, witnessed apnea is where a spouse says, I, you stop breathing. Right. And, and I've had people come to me and say, I tell my spouse that. And they go, no, I don't. And what they resort to is videotaping them and showing them. And they go, well, that was just one night. <laughs> yeah. So I always want to discount it. Nah, nah, nah. It's going right, to be fine. Right. Because yeah. people don't realize the impact it, of it. And neither did I. I mean, I snored. We had the group in. They sent me home. I came back. Yeah. And they said, how do you feel? I said, fine. And I go, why? And they go, you should feel awful. You are almost a severe apneic. Mm -hmm. And that's what opened my eyes. Yeah. I was lucky and unlucky in that I didn't have symptoms other than snoring. Yeah. And I didn't realize what I thought was a healthy night's sleep was really unhealthy and yeah. what it was leading to. Well, I think what, what often gets missed, I have a pulse ox that I put on patients' fingers. Yes. And it's not uncommon, and you're the expert, so you can validate this, that when people have sleep apnea, your oxygen, where right now if we measured each other, it'd be 98, 99%, Correct. right? And during an apneic episode, the oxygen can go down into the 80s. Oh yeah. And I will put it on a patient's finger and I'll say, just hold your breath until that registers 95. Nobody can do it, right? Mm -hmm. No. And think about, that's how, if you were to hold your breath for a minute, think about how short a breath you would feel and in an apneic episode, the oxygen's going way below that, down into right. the 80s. Now think about what does your nervous system do at two in the morning when your oxygen is 88% and the body feels like it's smothering to death? Mm -hmm. You think that affects your nervous system, okay? <laughs> Just a touch. So the, the, like you said, the folks that wake up and they have a morning headache or they have a little snoring, if you don't identify that your oxygen's going that low every single night, you're absolutely holding a knife to the throat of your nervous system, right? So what impact does that have on the heart? What is the impact does it have? What do you see in your patients? Or how do you correlate that with metabolic syndrome and other things? Well, the, the desaturation is huge. And what you just shared was exactly what I went through. That group that trained us, they put a pulse ox on, yeah. and they said, here's a guy with an apneic event, hold your breath. Yeah. And I, before it, it was 99. I'm holding my breath. After a minute, I look down, it's 97. I can barely breathe. <laughs> so the next day, they're reading these things yeah. off. And I go, how did I get down to 86%? 86. 86. Wow. I mean, they bring the crash card in at 90% in the ER. Yeah, yeah. And so that helped me to understand your body truly is paralyzed. But what happens is your brain starts to sense that, you know, my carbon dioxide's rising. Um, your blood starts to get thicker, your mm -hmm. heart has to beat harder, so there's this huge cardiovascular pressure, your mm -hmm. brain's trying to go through this, and all of a sudden, it does an adrenaline dump, which shocks your body. Mm -hmm. Just enough to do, yeah, and you roll over, and uh -huh. you may not remember it. Yeah. But that shock, all night, every night, starts to inflame the linings of all your arteries, the mm -hmm. heart's having to work harder, uh, all of a sudden it's rhythms getting thrown out of beat, and yeah. you know, all I do is snore. All I do is snore. All I do is snore. I see people, people come in and they'll go, huh, I just got diagnosed with AFib. This is new. And I always ask the question, well, wait a minute. Your genes didn't change, right? Right. Uh, your lifestyle is not that different. Something had to change. And, and a lot of those folks have sleep apnea, but they're unwilling to, to get the testing done. So let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest reservations I see with people when I say, you know, you might have sleep apnea, and this could be why you're having this and this and this. So let's get a sleep study done. Eh, I don't want to go into the hospital and sit in a weird room and be under cameras. Talk about how, so the person that you think is at risk, mm -hmm. what's the best way to figure it out? Um, one of the easiest little screening tools to get a good idea is something called the, uh, the stop bang. And okay. um, it's a simple little eight question. It's just snoring, are you tired? <clears throat> Has somebody seen you stop breathing? Do you have high blood pressure? You know, what's your body mass index, your age, neck size, and gender? Yeah. Uh, neck size is a pretty good screener. Yeah. If you're a male and 17 inches or larger, mm -hmm. if you're a female, I believe it's 15 and a half or larger, mm -hmm. uh, there's about a 60% chance that you've got some level of sleep apnea. 
Yeah. So that's one. And we have a lot of people go, well, I just snore. How do I know the difference? And I'm not going for a sleep test. Yeah. Um, we can do that, but more definitive, there is a home monitor uh, that you can go home with. And this will actually record six different levels of your sleep. You sleep with it. They bring the data in. We take a look at the data, and we can give you an idea of what percent it is. I want to show them that device, but I yeah. want to mention on here, this is what you and I would know as kind of Epworth scoring, and there's other scoring Correct. labels on this. And what's interesting, I ask this to patients all the time, if it's 2 in the afternoon and you're a passenger in a car, will you fall asleep? Or if you watch a TV show, or if you go to a movie? And I think that's one of the classic ones that I often hear people go, yeah, yeah, if it's 2 in the afternoon and I'm not really focused on something, I could really drift off. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a common risk that I think really heightens my concern. So I would say, well, why don't you go see Dr. Kitz Miller and get a sleep study? So tell them a little bit about what this, this guy is wearing. Uh, it's pretty non-invasive. Uh, it's just a little recording unit. Uh, it's like a tennis headband with a little nasal cannula. But uh, you go to sleep with this, and um, it will record your heart rate, uh, your stage of sleep, your desaturation. Is there a pulse ox on, on this device? It is incorporated into this. It's incorporated in here, so you don't have to wear anything on the fingers, Nothing just the all fingers. around the head. Okay. Correct. So you get a pulse ox, you get a heart rate. Yep. Does it, does it measure heart rate variability? Yes, it does. Okay. It does. Body position, decibel snoring. Okay. So it gets, it, it's a really nice real-time six-channel. This, this is what's cool about these things because it'll actually, like you said, it'll measure how loud are you snoring yeah. and it has an accelerometer so it can tell if you're turning or moving. That's what this thing is picking up, right? right. Um, but it's nice because it's non-invasive. You do this in your house mm -hmm. and th that's the thing I like about it is yeah. it, for the most part with the... Uh, you know, caveat that you got a headband on, you're in your normal sleeping environment. Right. So we're going to see what's happened when you're normally sleeping. Yeah. I like the, uh, the old fashioned, let's take you to the hospital. And if you've ever seen one of these rooms, <laughs> we're going to put you in a, somebody else's bed. We're going to attach about 18 wires to you. 22. 22. Yes. We're going to, uh, we're going to have, you know, this, this aquarium you sleep in mm -hmm. and then now just go ahead and go to sleep. Yeah. And by the way, <laughs> we're going to videotape you. And we're going to videotape <laughs> yeah. you. And none of this feels weird. Right? Not at all. I like these better than the old style hospital, in hospital. I think you get plenty of information from these devices. It's much more natural. It's like you said, you're in your natural environment. So it's very non-invasive. It's very simple to do. And yes. you get real-time information from this. Uh, you get AHI, which is apnea hypopnic index. You get Correct. enough information that you as a practitioner can make the determination if the, if the apnea is truly an issue. Yes. Right? And another nice thing that's important <clears throat> is um, it'll tell us how much REM sleep you're getting. Most people should get at least 25% of their sleep in REM sleep. Yeah. Anything less than that, you're cheating your body out of restorative capabilities right. and everything. And is it just measuring that, Tim, by the fact that when there's no movement? Because in REM sleep, your body's literally paralyzed. Your eyes are darting all about but your body's paralyzed. So is that basically how it's assessing that? Because it doesn't have an EEG capability. I am not certain if it's EEG or the accelerometer. Okay. So when you're in REM sleep, your body's completely paralyzed. That's why some people, they'll wake up in the middle of a dream, but their body lags. And you wake up and your brain's awake, but your body's paralyzed for three, four, five seconds. That's uh -huh. terrifying. It doesn't happen very often, but uh -huh. it can happen. And so the accelerometer is picking up the fact that the patient's not moving. What's interesting, we look at sleep um, physiology, and you're, you're going to talk about slow wave sleep, right? That's the most restorative. If you don't get into slow wave sleep, you won't get into REM sleep. And if you don't have those two, your brain can't repair. Right now, we're doing damage. We're breathing in pollutants, we're eating foods, we're creating oxidative stress. This is normal, but our bodies can repair at night if, and that's a big if, if we get into slow wave sleep and if we get REM sleep. There have been studies, and I've seen them documented, where patients are getting no REM sleep and no slow wave sleep. And here's the key kicker. Doctor, I'm having trouble sleeping. Oh, well, here's some Ativan. Here's some Restoril. Those drugs limit, decrease, impair your ability to get into slow wave sleep. The very thing that you might be taking to help you get to sleep doesn't let you get into slow wave sleep, right? Correct. So now if we have sleep apnea on top of that, we really complicated the issue. Yeah. So, very simple device. I love this little thing. Yeah. I love what you can learn from it. Um, so, let's say, okay, I'm listening to this and I go, oh, man, I got headaches, my blood pressure's high, and yeah, my wife says, all right, maybe I'll go get a sleep study. Yeah. But if I get this done, mm -hmm. and it comes back and it shows that I have apneic, non-breathing events at a certain number, yes. now I have to get a big fighter 
pilot mask and wear that thing at nighttime. That's a CPAP, right? Correct. That's Correct. the only way I'm going to fix this. So to hell with getting tested because I'm not wearing that son of a gun. Correct. Correct. We have quite a few people come to us just for that reason, or the wife says they're not going because that's the only solution. But that's not the only solution. Correct. We'll talk about that. Okay. There's really two other options. One uh -huh. is surgery. I'm not having surgery either. Yeah. Or, or well, the surgeries don't provide a guaranteed long-term result. Correct. And so it's a pretty dramatic step for something that may not get you where you want to be. Correct. Correct. Okay. And that's in the majority of cases. Sometimes it'll help, but most of the time it just... It just, uh, Tell resolves. them what they're doing surgically. Well, I think the best way that I can put this is um, we were having a conversation with an EMT specialist who uh -huh. does this. Yeah. And his comment to his patients was, in order to prepare them for what they're going for, I tell them, now for two weeks after the procedure, you're going to do nothing but lay on the couch thinking about how you can get back at me. <laughs> they literally will take anything that moves in the back of your throat off. So that little thing that hangs down, yes. that you look at, you know, when you go, ah, and you see that thing hanging down, they're going to go in and remove that and Tonsils, remove any soft everything. tissue back there that could get in the way. And that you hope that sounds skilled. barbaric. Really? I mean, it just, we're just yeah. going to rip that out. And, and, hey, there are some people that will get benefit from there that. There will. But not to downplay. it's not like a 95% success rate. No. no. I don't know what no. the success rates are, but I know they're not high. Would you say it's 50-50? Is it better than that, worse than that? I would say at best, especially at a five-year post-treatment mark. Okay. After that, it just slowly drops off from there. So it's a temporary, painful, not highly successful option. Correct. What else you got for me? What else I have is what's called oral appliance therapy. Okay. And that's what we provide for people. Um, it's very simply an appliance that just snaps on the upper and lower teeth, and it's, it's somewhat like a doorstop because most of the time with apnea, um, you know, people will have a normal bite and everything, and then yep. they'll, when they start, start to go to sleep and drop into that REM stage, the body totally relaxes, and that lower jaw drops back. It takes the tongue back, and that blocks the airway. Mm -hmm. So with CPAP, you have this gas mask here, and it just blows air to keep the... Right. airway open right with the uh, oral appliance basically it's like a small mouth guard um, you can still move talk drink with it but it, it almost acts as a doorstop so when you start to fall to sleep mm -hmm. it just keeps that jaw from dropping back it's almost like mechanical CPR because when an EMT gets on a scene the first thing they do tilt the head back pull the chin jaw forward, thrust open the airway yeah so it's just a mechanical way to keep the airway open it's amazing how simple it is and how brilliant it is because it like is. you said I spent 20 years in emergency medicine intubate people all the time First thing you do is put pressure on the jaw because that moves the tongue forward and it gets it out of the airway. And then you can see the structures and you can put a tube in. Correct. Um, so it is, it is quite simplistic. Um, so what are, what's the downside to this device? I mean, it looks quite simple. How successful is it at reducing snoring? Mm -hmm. um, can this work for severe apneics? Is it only for some people? Give me, give me a sense of the who it applies part. to. Yeah, yeah, because we get people all across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we get people come in, I snore, I don't think I have it. They'll find out, and it's primary snoring. We'll make them the same appliance. Yeah. And I would say 98% of the time takes care of the snoring, okay. whether you're apneic or not. Okay. Uh, for mild sleep apnea, success rate is probably 98%. All right. Um, because the disturbance isn't that great, and sometimes we don't even have to keep that jaw from dropping back much at all. Okay. Mild to moderate, I would say this should be the go-to. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends it as the first round treatment for that because okay. it, it's not too tough to keep the airway open to cure their problem. Right. Now we have a lot of severes that come to us and depending where they're at, we do recommend CPAP. And the yeah. reason is all they need to do is to turn that air pressure up and that will take care of it if you can tolerate it. If you can tolerate it. And that's another, that's a big question because like you said, it's, it's huge. A, it's a large mass that has to have a very tight seal Correct. and it's pumping air Correct. and you have to lay on your back and if you start moving around you can dislodge it and so air there, leaks and everything I'm, else i'm not trying to today convince anybody not to use cpap no, okay cpap no can means. work i have patients that benefit from it i have patients that love it i have yes. patients that travel with it they wouldn't dare sleep without it yes but we know that there's a big percentage i think one of the stats you shared with me that of all the people that try cpap 
Mm -hmm. How many of them wash out because they just can't tolerate the device? Um, they just did a huge study, and after two years, the success rate is about 40% people that are still complaining Not high. With it. No, no. Um, so it is an option. It is, and it is it is the gold standard by which they measure everything. Yeah, because but I, I think what gets lost in, in this discussion, and I really want everybody watching this to understand, there are some people that have to have CPAP. Have to. But there is a huge volume of people that don't even know they have apnea, that mm -hmm. could get away with a simple dental appliance, Yes. far less obtrusive, and every bit as successful at resolving the issue. The big thing with the two modalities is compliance. Yeah. You know, you have something that potentially is 100% effective if you can tolerate it, which is 40%. Yeah. This across the board is about 85% effective, but the compliance and tolerance of it is 85 to 90%. So more people, people are, are going to use do it. it. It's yeah. convenient. It travels well. There's no hoses. There's no water. Mm -hmm. um, it's just much more convenient. And for people in today's world, they want something that's convenient. I have, I have some patients that actually use this in combination with their CPAP, and it improves how well their CPAP works. It really does. I've even had patients, and again, this is not to detract you from using CPAP, but I had a woman that had a mold issue because of her CPAP device was, was growing mold. So yes. again, there's some care and upkeep of that device. It's not just put on the mask, go to sleep, and take it off the next day. Correct. Uh, so it's not just a simple answer there either. And, um, and truly, you're absolutely right. I mean, CPAP is awesome. There are people that need this to live on. Yes. Uh, they're so incapacitated. You know, when I when I have a person that's 350 pounds sitting in my chair going, you know, I just get this and <laughs> uh, you're going to fix me, right? And again, that 350 pound person's five foot two. Uh, it's like... With a neck that's 19 and a half inches. Yeah, and, yeah. and the only thing that collapses in there is the airway. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we highly recommend at least try it. But yeah. you're right, some people have bronchitis issues, some people have claustrophobia issues, those kinds of things. So we get severes in and we say, listen, you really owe it to your health to get healthy with this, but it's not for everybody. And, and it's kind of sad because those people typically, they'll return and say, I can't get used to it. And they go, yeah. well, great, then deal with the consequences. Right. They don't know about some of these other options and that's what's great I wanna, about I this. wanna explore those consequences. And I just wanna share this briefly because you're kind of on this, this topic right now. Now, this is not a CPAP. Uh, this is what's commonly referred to as a nasal pillow? Correct. Okay, and so talk about this a little bit. This is kind of a step down, a little gentler version of a CPAP. It is, and this is actually attached to a CPAP unit, but it doesn't have the full face. It's an attempt to make it more comfortable and user-friendly. And for many people in today's world, they have done a great job with CPAP. So it's getting yeah. better, more yeah. tolerable, but this is in lieu of having the full face. Now, if you're really severe, th this isn't gonna do it. This isn't gonna you're do gonna it. get the full face. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and a lot of times what I hear from patients, They'll come in and they recognize, yeah, I'm snoring, I probably do need a CPAP or I do need a sleep study, but doc, just help me lose 20 pounds and then a lot of that edema will go away and then I'll probably feel better and then I maybe won't snore. Mm -hmm. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Um, the challenge is, and I tell this all, all the time, you can eat the perfect diet, you can go to the gym every day, you can be outstanding, but if you have sleep apnea at night, uh -huh your body is not going to want to give up weight. It's going to be very challenging to get you to lose weight if every night your brain is struggling just to get oxygen into the body. And so that stress may preclude your ability to lose weight efficiently. Oftentimes I find that if I can convince somebody to get some type of testing done first yes, and use something like a dental appliance, anything that improves the quality of sleep, you're going to lose weight so much easier and keep it off and be so much more successful. And so, you know, it's trying to navigate those waters. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what happens to somebody who either doesn't get it diagnosed, doesn't get it treated, and like you said, when they can't tolerate CPAP, and, and in medicine, unfortunately, a lot of times we go, huh, we'll suffer the consequences. Done. What are the consequences of not figuring this out and not addressing it? Well, along the lines... You have this lovely thing. It's probably on your website, right? Yeah. What yeah. this says is everything in your body is just going to implode. <laughs> right, uh, right. <laughs> Get it taken care of. Every, every, every part of you. But I do want to convey that point. I hope that today, if you're watching this, you walk away from this knowing that a little problem right up here that stops you from breathing not only affects your blood vessels, your heart, your digestive, sexual response, hormones, Alzheimer's. You see this. Everything. 
everything. And, you know, is it directly causative of this? Not necessarily, but uh, medicine is finding out that there are so many parts of different disease processes mm -hmm. that are affected by the cardiovascular pressure mm -hmm. of basically suffocating every night. It makes yep. everything worse and the body can't heal itself. Right. And the body can heal itself. And that's our practice, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to teach you how to heal yourself. And if you're a patient of mine, you've heard me say this over and over and over again, stress kills. Oh, and this is one of the worst physiologic stresses I can do. Imagine mm -hmm. you're going to go to sleep every night, and while you're sleeping, I'm doing this, okay? Is that stressful on the body? So if we have not conveyed that point today, then we have failed. But I think we got that across. Correct. This physiologic stress on the body is going to alter cortisol. Cortisol is going to destroy your thyroid function. It's going to destroy hormonal balance. Mm -hmm. It's going to increase your blood sugar. It's going to increase your blood pressure. It's going to alter your lipids. It's going to create oxidative stress. Yes. It's going to increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Yes. The only thing I can't prove that it would increase your risk of cancer, but probably in some study it has. We went to a seminar. <laughs> yeah. And a very well-credentialed speaker, he said, I can almost prove that every form of cancer has some root in sleep apnea. Really? Yeah, it's, again, it's not causative, right, but it right. may have kicked off it something. It contributes. And along the lines of the weight loss that you were talking about, um, the hormonal regulation, mm -hmm. if you can't get into that REM reparative stage, mm -hmm. it messes up that leptin and ghrelin. Like you said, the, right. the hormones that make you hungry. Right. So all night long, your brain and body are fighting to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. You wake up exhausted, but you're hungry. Yeah. Because you've been fighting all night, whether mm -hmm. you realize it or not. It's interesting, you talk about leptin and ghrelin, <clears throat> those are our hunger hormones, and, mm -hmm. and when they get altered by physiologic stress, yeah. then you can eat and eat and eat, but you're not gonna feel satisfied. No. You're lep you get leptin resistance, and th that balance. It's amazing how simple life can be oh. if we just eat real foods, and we sleep. get some sleep, and we get a little exercise, <laughs> and you manage your stress, do a little meditation. It's simple. It's all. But we, we ignore the simple things. We don't respect our sleep. Um, you're, you're a sleep guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I read statistics on this. I read a statistic years ago that it was 1965, 1970, and there was a, a, a government-sponsored poll taken uh, that asked a lot of different health questions of the American populace. But one of the answers that came back was the average hours of sleep per night was eight to nine hours of sleep a night. That was average in America, yeah. okay? Yeah. Then they did it again, like in 1990, and then again, I think the last time I saw his numbers was 2004. And over that time, it went from eight to nine hours down to seven hours, and I think the current average is around six hours. Six to six and a half hours in today's world. Okay, isn't that crazy? <laughs> Your body. How can your body function? It just doesn't stand much of a chance. I mean, even <laughs> even if you're able to get into REM, I mean, there's yeah. there's three different cycles through. But if you shorten your night, you know, the first half you're not going to get into it, so you're you're shortchanging yourself. Yeah, we we just don't respect it, and I think that's the biggest thing. As we work with our patients, we say, look, the first thing you schedule in a day is your sleep cycle. When are you going to go to bed? When are you going to get up? That's first. Then you have your coffee. Then you go to the office. Then everything else falls into place. It's such a critical piece, and I just think it gets swept under the carpet. I don't think our medical model is really invested in helping our patients understand the importance of sleep. So, right. if we have not stimulated some curiosity in you, then we have failed miserably. I don't think we failed. So, uh, hopefully, we got some questions coming in. Chris, do we have anything? We do. Sleep apnea. Can you have it forever? Once you have it today, could you have it forever? Yes, you will have it forever. Um, sleep apnea basically means sleep without breath. Um, sadly, it's treatable but not curable. Um, they haven't come up with anything yet. They're working on some interesting technologies. They, they now have a sensor that uh, is implanted that mm -hmm. when it senses you stop breathing, your tongue is brought forward. But uh, yes, you, it, in current state, you can only treat it. You cannot cure it. So you pretty much have it for lifetime. What if, I mean, because this is a common thought and probably part of my thinking as well, that if I'm healthy, how did I get sleep apnea? A lot of people would say, well, it's because I gained weight, and so the airway gets a little smaller, we get redundant tissues, mm -hmm. and if I lose the weight, won't I get rid of the reason I have apnea? It may help, but it does not discriminate. We've had people that are very thin, low BMIs, not much body fat, mm -hmm. and they're miserable. 
with morning headaches, you know, and their index may only be 10, but it's just taking its toll on them. So uh, sadly, it does not discriminate. And the reason for that is everybody has variability in the collapsibility of their airways. Mm -hmm. um, it's just physiological differences. We can take three people, identical, yeah. have the same index, put them in the same appliance, same position, have three widely variable endpoints. Why is that? Just the individual variability. Okay. You can't control how this collapses. Do you see people that, like you said, that once you have the disease, you can treat it, but you can't cure it. Mm -hmm. But have you seen people that have significantly altered either their diet or their weight or their lifestyle and reversed their AHI to the point that they don't need an intervention? Correct. A 10 to 20 pound weight loss can drop somebody from moderate to mild or mild down to a healthy state. Okay. As long as they maintain that. It has yeah. to be, you know, something ongoing. It becomes what? a lifestyle. You have to keep the weight off? I am sorry to say that. <laughs> sorry to say that. Hugely so, disappointing. Well, and that's, you know, that's a, that's, that's a situation we wrestle with on a regular basis. Yeah. And that, that comes down to your belief system, your lifestyle, and the things that we yeah. teach in this practice. And along There's that, no good to lose 20 pounds and regain it. Right. But it is possible to keep it off. That's encouraging. Um, but um, good, good points. Uh, Chris, what else? Totally. Uh, getting a little little deep for this one. Uh, <laughs> is it possible that you can die uh, with sleep apnea in your sleep? Absolutely. I think uh, one of the poster childs of that unfortunate event is uh, Reggie White, former NFL football player. Really? Um, he died in his sleep, and they directly attribute it to the side effects and consequences of his untreated sleep apnea. Ah. Um, you know, did it kill him directly? It, probably indirectly. Uh, you know, he wasn't breathing, um, so it could be that they said you died of a heart attack. Well, but that, we know that sleep apnea can create arrhythmias, and so did the sleep apneic event create an arrhythmic event that ended up in cardiovascular compromise that killed him? Typically, you? that's it. When you hear somebody died in their sleep, yeah. did they snore? Well, yeah, like a freight train. Yeah. It was that final episode mm -hmm. where their heart couldn't stand it after yeah. years and nightly episodes of the brain going wake up right right and just gave out yikes yeah. okay so yeah absolutely lethal mm -hmm. potentially stroke diabetes and i think that's 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 often missed um i tell people this all the time as we look at their sugar we look at their their cholesterol like if your c-reactive protein <clears throat> it's a marker of inflammation and your hemoglobin A1C are high, I'll look at them and I'll say, understand you're placking right now. You're making plaque in your vessel today and tomorrow. When do you want this to stop? When are we gonna stop having the cookies and donuts? When are we gonna get the CRP to come down so that you stop placking? Because we're doing damage, 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 and at some point the body goes, all right, I'm, I'm out of rope, we're done. done. And the same with sleep apnea, you would say, right? Mm -hmm. Every single night you snore, you're doing a little bit of damage. A little bit. And at what point do we go, okay, look, I'm tired of, I'm tired of ruining my body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Chris, what else you got? Totally. A lot. Several questions. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, is it possible to, to test yourself for this at home? You know, without a home monitor, I, I would say I yes. Don't. That's what your wife is. She, she's <laughs> right. a, she, yeah. If, if you're waking up with sore ribs and you snore, trust me, you got it. I know. Uh, Ask me how. But no, I, um, we, we're being we're we're being a little flip and we're having right. fun with it. But I would say your first warning system is your wife saying, oh, you "You're snoring," breathing. and I heard you stop breathing. Mm -hmm. I mean. That, that's the first indicator, right? Right. But go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. Not at all. Uh, there are some interesting um, wrist devices now, Fitbits. Uh, there are some other appliances out there that do monitor sleep. Um, how they do this, I don't know. They're, I don't believe they're monitoring desaturations, but somehow they're giving you an idea of what's healthy sleep and what's not. Yeah. The exact metrics of that, I am unsure of. So diagnostically, from a pure standpoint, I'd say probably not, but it may give you a pretty good idea. If, if you see that you may have a problem, I would suggest you take some of these questions here. And with that questionnaire, if you score more than three positives on it out of the eight questions, it can be up to 90% predictive. So I think the question, like you said, that's a very easy way. Uh, I think the technology right now, I, I have a whoop and I've looked at some of that other technology. What they're claiming and what can be proven, there's, there's still a gap. 
Yeah. Uh, we can't even, we don't even have a wrist device that reliably gives us an RR interval that we can get heart rate variability with. Right. The devices are claiming they can. I don't know if the science is really there. I think the, some of the technology, like the Fitbit, is if they're not seeing periods of immobility, uh -huh. it's making an algorithmic assumption that there's no REM sleep, mm -hmm. and they're then grading the quality of the sleep based on that. But that's supposition, because I don't know their algorithm. Right. But I don't know that the technology of wrist devices is, but, but look, if it gives us a clue, yeah. uh, a suspicion, then that, because this kind of testing is easy. Yes. And it's yes. not terribly expensive. Not at all. Not at all. In our office, we only charge for the disposables. I think it's around three hundred dollars something. Three hundred like bucks to uh -huh. find out if you're if you're at risk. Just to save your life. Just to save your life. It's nothing big. <laughs> so uh, no, I think that that and, and by the way, a Whoop is five hundred dollars to buy that device. <laughs> uh, a Fitbit's at least a hundred bucks to buy that device. So right. that's that's a darn downright bargain. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. What else we got? So, uh, CPAP machine, is there, a, is there another solution than to using a CPAP? Yes, with the, um, the, the two other options currently available uh, would be surgery, uh, as we had mentioned, but there's a great failure rate after five years of that relapse. You're back to square one, except now you can't swallow right and you went through a painful episode. Uh, the other alternative is the oral appliance. Yep. And um, for mild to moderate, um, there are studies that show it just as effective as CPAP, again, without being as invasive. Um, in the more severe categories or where there's comorbidities, uh, you're going to certainly want to try CPAP first to see if that can take care of you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the other thing, as a dentist, you know, when we do certain procedures, it's black and white. It's done. Mm -hmm. And the most frustrating thing for me was getting into the medical world where it's an imperfect science. Mm -hmm. I mean, that blew my mind. And I had to get over myself. And the thing that helped me was a sleep specialist, Yeah. because we always try to go back and give them reports. And I said, listen, this guy was severe. We took him from high severe down to mid moderate. Mm -hmm. I said, but he's not fixed. Mm -hmm. And the doc looks at me, and says, congratulations. That's I, a win. <laughs> and I go, but he's still broken. Yeah. He goes, no, think about the pressure you took off of that guy's cardiovascular system. Is he going to live longer than if he didn't do anything? I said, yep. without a doubt. Yep. So, you know, I had to get over that too. Okay. But those are the options. Surgery, CPAP, oral appliance. Yeah. So, um, what are the long-term consequences of using a mandibular advancement device? Um, actually, I personally experienced that. Um, there, the consequences would be some, in most cases, temporary soreness in the jaw joint, jaw muscles, possibly the teeth. But once you're titrated out to your treatment position and you stay in that, those symptoms go away. Because you're, you're stretching muscles and ligaments, and so there's an adjustment period. There is, and they're used to being there yeah. for your whole life. Right. So you get through that, that's what happens probably 50% of the time. I would say 30% of the time, there's no consequence. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have started doing because of this, we've been doing this for about 10, 11 years, and it's evolving as it goes on. Sure. We will provide people with a, um, an exercise device. We will capture their bite where it's at in the beginning. Oh, yeah? Because if you don't exercise, these muscle bellies will kind of change. Well, I exercise every day. I, I get my Big Mac. The Big Mac. you got to make sure you get that or the quarter pounder. <laughs> um, but the big thing is I didn't do anything about to preserve my bite. So my bite changed. Okay. Um, the problems that caused is I just can't chew almonds as well as I used to. And really? I'm a dentist. My bite is not ideal. Uh -huh. But at the end of the day, my bad bite is not going to kill me. Yeah. But my sleep apnea will. Yeah. I could probably get it back if I huh. decided to go to CPAP, but okay. I like my oral appliance. I'm a rotisserie sleeper. I can't do that with CPAP. Okay. And what about orthodenture uh, work affecting that? Would that be the solution for your bite to go get some orthodontic, uh, orthodontic Correct. work done? So okay. I would, I would go back. But yeah. it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, though, because the human body, as you know, is so adaptable. I may have adapted to a bad bite yeah. because that's where your brain will tell you where your teeth fit. Yeah. Well, if you look at this, it's flat. 
your yeah. teeth can go, your muscles can go to a relaxed position. Mm -hmm. And there's also a high consequence of grinding with untreated sleep apnea. So this yeah. acts as a splint. Yeah. So it keeps you from breaking teeth and lets your muscles go where they want to. Dr. Uh, Nelson Deers, a uh, good guy. friend and a great guy great and guy. orthodontist, and he does a lot of this work. He and I are on a, on a sleep council. Um, that we, we meet with uh, multidisciplinary physicians and, and dentists and doctors in the city. Uh, Nelson Deere's awesome, great guy. S mad scientist in this realm. Isn't yes, he? He awesome. Is. Yeah. So I mean, if you're looking for orthodontics and you need help in this area, I couldn't recommend highly recommend it. more highly somebody other than uh, Nelson Deere's in this area. Um, go ahead, Chris. What else you got? What's the cost range? of the uh, mandibular advancement. Oh, we knew that would come. That's a great question. Because <laughs> nobody ever asked that, right, Lori? <laughs> um, They're free. <laughs> right. After the initial deposit. After the initial <laughs> no. deposit. Um, our office has become affiliated with most major medical carriers as well as Medicare. Um, entering the uh, medical world, we had to do this as part of our due diligence in order to treat people. So because of our affiliation, um, we have been able to get people's out-of-pocket expenses uh, down to somewhere between 500 to 3,000. Okay. Um, we have different <clears throat> ways that we can help them take care of that too, but we will maximize their insurance for them. And we do complimentary consultations. We will find out prior to anything what your insurance carrier does provide as far as a benefit goes. Um, but again, it's uh, an investment. It is an investment and a very valuable investment. Um, we were talking before we started filming this and I said, how long would this last? How long will a device last? And you had answered that. We Yes, we give people a range of three to eight years. Again, a lot of it depends on the individual. Some people are vicious grinders. and there's, We've had people come in and say it broke. And I go, did you run over that? And they go, no, I woke up and I heard a crack. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's just what happens to people in their sleep. Mm -hmm. But three to eight years, we roughly see as a range. Insurance will uh, reimburse after about three or four years. So a lot of people will get a secondary appliance. Gotcha. And the secondary appliance does not cost nearly as much as the first. But I want to put this in perspective. Even if you say, well, I only got five or six years out of my device, that's five or $600 a year. That's less than $2 a day. Mm -hmm. What did your Starbucks cost you this morning? Four bucks, <laughs> right? And that I'll was spend, with the heavy cream, right? I'll spend four <laughs> bucks on a latte, but I'm not gonna spend two bucks a day on a dental appliance. I'm just trying to put it in perspective because you and I were making light of this but realistically, if you said, I can extend your life and the quality of your life and your brain will be more active and your energy will be better and your sex drive will be better and it's only going to cost you 500 bucks a year, shoot, let me get my wallet out. <laughs> right. Right? And so, I mean, it's putting it in perspective. And that, that number up front, $3,000, wow, that's a blunt stick. But when you look at the, the, the benefits you're getting, when you look at the years that's going to last you, it's a no-brainer. So it's silly on not medications. To. Look at how much money we spend on, on silly things. Yeah. Right? Correct. So, I mean, putting it in perspective, if I would challenge anybody watching this, how much money do you spend every year at McDonald's or Pizza Hut? I bet you it's more than 500 bucks. You know, the other one, and God love Lori in the office, she came up with this. Yeah. It's called relationship preservation. <laughs> now, put a price on that. Your wife. To stop snoring. <laughs> Your think about what that does. If my wife snored every night and kept me awake, it would definitely have a relationship impact. That love starts to fade a little bit. Oh, yeah. He's a nice guy. But. <laughs> but. but. All right. What else you got, Great Chris? question. So before shifting gears into another question, um, I've got follow-up questions. Uh, I want to get a test. Where can I? Where can I go? What can I do? How can I get? Uh, how can I get answers to some of this? Uh, as I'd mentioned, our office offers complimentary consultation. We'll cover everything you want in that. What is it? Do I have it? Now that I have it, where do I go? What do I do? What are my treatment options? How much is it going to cost me? We can truly help to act as a quarterback in your treatment for this sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will also work in conjunction with your primary care, any and all of your specialists. We want them to be on board with what we're doing because it affects you in so many ways. And yes, I am a general dentist, but I am not here to steal you from your dentist. I just have a personal vested interest in helping people with sleep apnea because I didn't know and I know what it can do to people now. And, and that's important to know, too. You are a dentist. That's your training. But that's who does sleep medicine, right? Correct. Uh, the physicians, doctors, MDs, DOs, 
we don't we don't do this kind of thing. You no. want so you want a technician that understands how these devices work, and that's classically what we see. Yes, uh, orthodontists and dentists doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, if you're in our practice, we're we're going to be assessing your sleep quality, and we're going to be making referrals and recommendations for sleep studies. Mm -hmm. So uh, if your if your primary care physician is not, if you have some of the questions that on this questionnaire that were positive, and this is on your website, right? I believe so. Okay, believe so, so if you go look at Stop Bang, um, eight questions, go answer them, and if you said if you have more than three of them that are positive, then your chances of having sleep apnea are? Just about 90%. About 90%, mm -hmm. okay. And again, the classic ones are, do you snore? Uh, do you fall asleep in the afternoon? You know, if you're not engaged in something, do you do you, do you start to bob? What are some of the other ones you come, the big neck, of course. Big neck. Big one. Uh, Sadly, if you're a male, that's a big one. Well, I um, can't change that. <laughs> right, right. Well, I can, but I don't want to. <laughs> right. But it's, it's neck size, age, body mass, uh, high blood pressure. That's a huge one. Okay. If you snore and you got high blood pressure, there's 70% chance yeah. you got some level. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. So, um, great. Uh, so switching to a different topic from a, from a previous episode, uh, CBD, <laughs> CBD oil. Yes. Uh, Just rub it on your gums, your sleep apnea will go away. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so what is, a, uh, what is a recommended brand uh, for a toddler with sensory issues? That has become a very interesting issue because in the state of Ohio, as recently as last week, it became illegal to sell CBD oil in the state of Ohio, right? Because apparently it's 1902, and the scientists haven't figured out that CBD and THC are two different, completely different compounds. Um, so at this point, we were working with a couple of companies that we had validated that we thought they had good product. Right now, legally, I can't recommend the sale of CBD oil within Ohio. Um, in the past, I'd recommended Thorn Research that is a company that made something called hemp oil that I still think is a validated quality product. The problem that I see as a professional, as I look at CBD oil and hemp oil in the marketplace, there are good companies and there are not so good companies. So going online and just ordering CBD oil, I don't know where you're getting it from. Um, this is a conversation I probably should have with somebody in private because with, this, with the legal temperament right now, I don't want to go on video saying, you should go here and get your CBD oil. Okay, <laughs> this is it's amazing. The laws are changing almost every other month in terms of this topic. Uh, and in other states, it's perfectly legal. Right now, it's not legal in Ohio. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just sit quietly. <laughs> That's a rant for another day. That's a rant for another day. And boy, have I got a soapbox. It's this big. So uh, where can again? Where can we find you? What's the website? What's a possible phone number? Um, our website is Cincy Smiles, C I N C I Smiles dot com. Uh, email office at Cincy Smiles dot com, and our phone number is uh, area code five one three two four eight 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 four eight. And my number, <laughs> Dr. Call, Gary Huber, Huber Personal. Call Dr. Medicine, Huber, he'll, he'll let you know. Area code 513 924 5300. And uh, Chris, I'm sure, is flashing up on the screen. So, um, are we out of questions for the day? What was that website again? That website was Cincy Smiles, C I N C I dot com, Cincy Smiles dot com, mm -hmm. and Huber PM, as in Huber Personalized Medicine dot com, Huber PM, H U B E R. Um, we have a lot of information on our website. Our Facebook page where you're watching this has lots of videos. CBD oil is one of them. Uh, we've talked about all kinds of things, metabolic syndrome and, and sleep disorders and a whole slew of things, thyroid disorders. So please partake of those things. Get smart, get educated. Um, you are more interested in your health than anybody else. And we trust in our doctors, we trust in our healthcare system, but at the end of the day, an educated patient uh, makes better choices and, and they can make discerning decisions. And more importantly, they can stop themselves from getting from becoming sick, right? Yes. If we yes. eat better, sleep better, exercise better, and that's what we want for all of our patients. I wanna teach you how to not need me. I wanna put me out of business if I can by making you really smart on how to take care of your bodies. Um, people are hungry for that kind of information and we just want to provide it. Yeah, We've you, got, guys, you guys do a great you job. You and I are it. never going to be out of patience. <laughs> I would love to have fewer because I've made them healthier. Exactly. And, and I know you feel the same I way. I agree. 
So I, agree. I want to thank you so much for today. Thank it you was for having awesome. me, Gary. Great conversation. Yeah. If you have any questions and you email them in later, I promise you we'll forward them and, and Tim will get them and we'll forward you some answers. Uh, are we done? Last question. <gasps> so I know you guys, I know you do a, a ton of uh, posting elsewhere on other social platforms. What, yeah. What are, what are some of those? Uh, Instagram. My good friend Chris tries to beat me over the head with a stick to make me post on Instagram on a daily basis. I don't quite do it every day, but I'm, I'm getting better. So, uh, um, um, Huber Personalized Medicine, is that my Instagram page, Huber Personalized? Huber Personalized Medicine, Instagram, check us out. Um, we have our Facebook page, Huber Personalized Medicine, and we do, everything we do here is on YouTube. So we have our own YouTube channel, Dr. Gary Huber, YouTube.com. You can pull up all these videos. I even put them in categories, okay? Nutrition and cardiovascular and thyroid and adrenal. He does. I watched a lot this <laughs> weekend. They're really good at yeah. it, too. They're he engaging. Was, yeah, he was good <laughs> watching me, so I feel bad for Tim. But we, we're just going to keep putting this information out there because we want to again, we want to give you tools so you can make better decisions. So check us out on Facebook. Check us out on uh, huberpm.com. Uh, YouTube, and my Instagram. My Instagram gets a little wacky because it's just me and my camera, so anything's possible, okay? You might catch me in all kinds of uh, situations. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, for, for uh, driving and steering us. And Tim, yes. thanks so much for coming in. Lori, his wife, is sitting here, and uh, uh, thank you again for everything. Uh, all right? My pleasure. All right, guys, you got a lot of information. Now mm -hmm. act on it. Do something. Take care. Sleep well. <laughs> yeah, sleep well. Sleep well.